Thank you very much. Um, I'm always happy to come back to Ann Arbor, um, and not just for Zingerman's, but uh, uh, this is where I went to law school, and um, I have fond memories of, of the other side of campus, mainly, uh, coming over here largely for Angelo's, uh, I would say, is as close as I ever got here. But um, uh, Crypto Wars Part de, um a little joke there for those of you. Uh, and how, uh, how the NSA is making us all left safe. And I will tell you, um, this was a conversation that I wanted to start a long time ago, and it came uh, from a New York Times story. How do I move to the next one? Like that. Uh, uh, that you may have seen in September of 2013 um, about what the NSA has been doing to our technologies. Um, these are just quotes from the slides. Uh, that were leaked, and that the NSA, very interestingly, did not deny. Um, they haven't admitted, but they haven't denied either. Um, and I think, you know, I, I have to tell you, this made me angry all the way down to my bones. Um, and uh, we'll get back to the specifics of this in the meantime. Um, but first, I want to explain why it is I was so angry in my bones. Well, um, it's because. In the 1990s, as Kevin mentioned, I was involved in trying to free up cryptography from governmental control. Um, you may remember, uh, some of you are old enough to remember, but you all should know if you're studying cryptography now, that cryptography didn't used to be something that you could do very freely in this country. Why? Because on the list of US, uh, the US has what are called export regulations, uh, things that you need to get a government license for before you can send them out of the country. Um, and those things, that list includes tanks and surface to air missiles and, you know, tomahawks and all sorts of, of actual weapons. And on that list until 1999 was, uh, I'm sorry, two, uh, yeah, that's right, uh, 1999 was software with the capability of maintaining secrecy. Software with the capability of maintaining secrecy was regulated by this country as a weapon. It wasn't even on the Commerce Department's list. It was on the State Department's list of munitions. And you could not get a license to export cryptography that had stronger than a 40-bit key when we started this. And the second part of that is that the government defined and still defines export to mean any publication on the internet. So any, and it also includes, it includes foreign students, it includes a lot of other things, but the, but the centerpiece of the case that we did was that the government was basically requiring a license if you wanted to publish computer code on the internet that let people keep things secret. That was the basis of the Bernstein case. I represented Dan Bernstein, and we challenged those regulations on the grounds of the First Amendment that the government doesn't get to license your speech unless it's a very, very narrow category of things, things that can surely, directly, and immediately cause irreparable damage to our nation or its people. I didn't make that up. That's in the Pentagon Papers case, uh, where Daniel Ellsberg, a whistleblower of a generation ago, published information that the government said was dangerous, and the Supreme Court said, this is how dangerous it has to be before you get to stop somebody from speaking before they speak. Surely directly immediate irreparable harm to our nation or its people. And the Pentagon Papers didn't meet that test. And I would submit that software with the, maintain, with the capability of maintaining secrecy doesn't meet that test either. Um, it turns out we were right. Um, we won. We got, in, we got uh, and we won on a couple of levels. We won in the threshold determination that computer code is protected speech under the First Amendment which doesn't mean that the government can't regulate it, but it means it has to meet a much higher standard than if it regulates just things. Now, those of you who are thinking about the Internet of Things are already guessing that time, the time in which we could distinguish between code and things is, is, um, is fast closing, and this is going to cause us some interesting First Amendment questions, especially in the context of 3D printers, very soon. But in the 1990s, it seemed like there was enough of a distinction there that we could talk about this, and so we did. So what did we do? Well, first of all, we won, and we won in the courts and the Ninth Circuit, but before this went up further, the Clinton administration at the time backed down, and they took strong cryptography off of the U.S. munitions list. They took it off of the commerce control list. There is still a very tiny little regulation um, that applies to some uh, crypto. If it's open source crypto, you have to send an email to the government and say, hey, I'm about to send this outside the country, but they can't stop you. 
And if it's uh, some, some kind of closed source proprietary stuff, there is still a deeper regula regulation that might apply. But those people have lawyers and they can navigate that. But the result is we all have strong crypto, theoretically, in our tools. Um, we also, EFF was involved in retiring DES, which was an early crypto standard that was very, very weak um, and took a long time for the government to, uh, to admit that it was weak and, 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 and adopt new standards. Um, EFF built something called the DES Cracker uh, with a bunch of PCs. It demonstrated that you could break DES in, I don't remember the timeline, but a very, very short period of time to demonstrate how weak DES was. Um, we defanged the export restrictions. And the government's proposal, which was you only get to use strong encryption if you give us a key, um, which was called key escrow. And uh, there was something called the clipper chip that was going to make this all happen. This is all history for people. If you want to read uh, uh, Stephen Levy's book, Crypto, is probably the, you know, for those of you who, are like me, are lawyers and not techies, a, a nice non-technical description of, of these fights. Um, that idea, dead. The idea that the government got to dumb down our technology and have back doors into our security on the off chance that one of us might be a criminal and they might need access was an idea that died in the 1990s. It died in Congress, it died in the courts, and it died in the administration. We have three branches of government, count them, one, two, three, died in all three of them. <laughs> So that's where we were in the late 1990s. Yay, we won, go EFF. Um, and go all of us, right? Because we all get to have a secure community. Now, what happened after that is we kind of failed the mortals of the world, I think. And I, I, by we, I mean all of us who understand how this technology works and helps build them. We didn't build end-to-end -end encryption into our phones, into our text messages, into all of these technologies. We didn't protect data at rest very well. Um, we did replace Telnet, woohoo! Um, and EFF uh, built something called HTTPS Everywhere, uh, which is an attempt to try to secure the web a little bit, but honestly, compared to the size of the problem, I mean, I'm really proud of the work that my colleagues did on that, but that's nothing compared to what we need to do to build a secure internet. Um, um, so what happened? Well. What we now learned, and what we learned in September of 2013, is that the government has been taking advantage of our failure here to make a secure internet for mere mortals. They have been taking advantage of security holes, of errors in coding, of any mistakes that you guys might make in the tools that you're build. They are exploiting to try to get to them, uh, to try to get access, to try to build a world in which they do have access to every single communication, every single piece of data that we might store online. Um, to build the key escrow universe that they wanted to build, just build it differently, secretly, and without our permission. Um, and you know, one of the, the, the most telling things to me was a quote from the general counsel of Microsoft after the September results, in which he said, the government is an advanced persistent threat to the internet. This is Microsoft. I mean, we're not talking me here. Uh, we're talking about people who, who are generally very friendly to the government in terms of wanting to be a cooperative, good corporate citizen. Not that I'm not a good citizen. Um, and so where did we see it? Well, we, we, we've seen it in a bunch of places. We saw on October 4th, 2013, uh, a whole set of PowerPoint slides that talks about how much they hate Tor, um, uh, um, that it was being actively targeted, this technology that frankly was built with our tax dollars. Tor started off as a, uh, do folks know what Tor is? I'm gonna get some nods here. Tor is a way that you can browse the web securely such that people can't see what you're looking at. It does other things too, but that's the main thing that people think about for Tor. Um, and that this technology was built with government support. It started as a project of the Navy. Um, and then EFF housed it for a while, now it's an independent organization, but that our tax dollars built this thing and now our tax dollars are being used to actively target this thing that was built to try to protect us all. Now the good news is that cores, the core security of Tor, the math of Tor and other crypto systems appear to still be safe, but the implementations, as you know, the devil's in the details of the implementations and it's very, very hard to do crypto securely now. Why? Because we fear, we failed mere mortals, remember, back there. What else did we learn? Uh, nice story uh, from The Intercept, which is the, uh, one of the first look uh, uh, publications uh, with a bunch of internal uh, reports from a guy who says, I hunt sysadmins. Um, 
uh, talking about all the various ways in which they can sabotage uh, uh, Sisyphus, talking about man-in-the-middle attacks, talking about spoofing, talking about uh, how, to, how to figure out how to basically trick you and your Sisyphus into giving them access. Um, um, uh, so we've got a government that's engaged in trickery, that's engaged in active attacks, and in buying their way into our technologies, apparently. RSA reportedly took $10 million in order to not fix and not acknowledge a weakness in the BeSafe archive. Earlier this week, we saw another problem with RSA, with dual EC, another thing. Um, now, it's interesting in RSA's context, and it may point a way forward for us. The head of RSA at the RSA conference this year said, this stuff has got to stop. We've got to stand up. Companies can't be in the middle anymore, and we have to make sure that we build the future we want to build. He quoted John F. Kennedy. It was a very stirring speech. Now, you know, um, I really like really stirring speeches, but the rubber needs to meet the road. We need to see what RSA is actually going to do with all those fine words now that they've said them. But that's a good start, and getting tech companies and security companies out from this position where they think they can be neutral and not part of this debate when they are actively being attacked is the first step towards fixing it. And so we need to support the companies that are, that are doing this, and while, even as we push them to do more. Um, what else do we know? Well, I, I, I hope you guys have all seen this slide. Uh, this is how the government attacked Google in the Google Cloud. Um, and, um, oh, sadly, the way I cut and pasted this, you missed the best part, which is a little smiley face at the bottom, the government congratulating themselves for having figured out how to hack into the Google servers abroad. Um, we've, we've seen, um, um, and this one famously uh, got a response from a Google engineer, not Google itself, but the, uh, I think one of my favorite quotes of last year, which is, um, and excuse me, uh, but uh, fuck those guys, uh, <laughs> is what the response was from the Google engineers. Again, this, is the, this company pays taxes. They are a corporate citizen. They hire Americans. They hire people all around the world. They are the kind of people that the government should be supporting, not attacking. This is wrong. It's broken on such a fundamental level. What else did we learn? We learned about phishing attacks, something called quantum exploit, which I think everybody should pay attention to because it appears to be their favorite tool, which is a way to fake uh, basically a phishing attack, the faking logins um, so that you can capture people's uh, uh, passwords and, and logins and then, and then trying to deploy those in such a way that you figure out what all the other logins are. Um, and the I Hunt Sysadmins guy's uh, explanation about how they do this is a, good, is a pretty good primer for how um, these kinds of attacks work. Now, not much of this is very new. People who follow what actual bad guys do with malware and phishing attacks and stuff will recognize that a lot of these are the same techniques. But, you know, we didn't expect them from our own government. Um, scooping up Google's pref cookies and using those cookies as a way to try to spoof things, doing all sorts of crazy things. Uh, this is a short list of some of the malware I found, malware techniques that the NSA is using against folks. Um, and uh, and um, this comes from The Intercept if you want to look them up. I'm not going to go through them all individually, but let's just say that this is just a small subset of them. EFF did our April Fool's edition a couple days ago, and we made up a whole bunch of phony names, so some of them are pretty good, and how they catch you singing in the shower and stuff like that. But it's pretty incredible the amount of effort that has gone into trying to make sure that nobody can ever have a private conversation in a digital environment. Right? Now, I'm not saying the NSA shouldn't be doing, having uh, the ability to get access to some things in a targeted way, but this goes far beyond, I think, what most people thought they were doing. Um, exploiting poor security and coding errors. Um, people heard, I suspect, last year that Angry Birds leaks a lot of information about you. Uh, there's something that they use called Happy Foot that tries to use some of that leaky information to do location tracking of people. Um, so all of this stuff has come out. There's been a lot, I think, a pretty significant amount of uproar. There's been uproar about parts of the other parts of the NSA spying, which I'm happy to talk about too, but I was coming here and I really wanted to focus on the crypto here. Um, and, and what's the government's response been? Nothing. Not a single word of support to the American people and the American companies about why they are actively using our tax dollars to attack us. <coughs> Nothing. 
President Clinton's, uh, President Clinton, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> President Obama's given several speeches about the NSA spying where he's trying to reassure the country and he says he's taken steps. He's gonna take some steps with regard to various different things. He said nothing about this stuff. And that silence is really deafening, I think, in terms of what's going on in our country. So what does the law have to say about this? Um, sadly, I think at this point, very little. Um, and that may be something that has to change. Um, most, many of the techniques that I'm using, the government uses abroad. So like the Google hack that we're talking about. Those are Google's foreign servers, as far as we can tell. Um, the, gover the, the government's ability to uh, engage in activities abroad uh, around surveillance is governed by um, EO 12333, Executive Order 12333, um, which creates certain limits on what the government can do with regard to American citizens, but no limits on what the government can do with regard to foreigners abroad. Um, they, they use the term U.S. persons, which can include green cards and people who are here temporarily. It doesn't include student visas. There's a complicated thing, so we'll call it U.S. persons. It's a, it's a long list of things, but it's fair to say foreigners abroad, no protection whatsoever from whatever the hell the NSA wants to do to them. And so, um, and then the, and the NSA is using that as a basis upon which to do a lot of things abroad that it probably couldn't get away with in this country. Um, the bad part from our perspective as somebody who tries to bring government actions into a rule of law is that the executive order is very, very difficult to challenge in the courts. Um, foreigners abroad don't have Fourth Amendment rights under the current jurisprudence. If they don't have statutory rights, and this is done by an executive order, not a statute, there's very little that we can do on behalf of foreigners abroad. Now, EFF is doing a lot of work internationally to try to develop some international tools to address this, but I'm a US lawyer trained here at Michigan Law School. The tools that I use best are lawsuits in this, inside this country, and they really aren't available for a lot of what's going on here. To the extent that they catch Americans in America with some of these exploits, there may be. There would be a claim. A lot of this is just plain old hacking. It's the kind of thing that I advise people in this room about sometimes. Uh, uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act makes it illegal to uh, exceed your authorized access in somebody else's machines. There's a lot of problems with that law, and we're working to try to reform it. But it plainly ought to and does uh, reach some of the garden variety hacking attacks that the NSA has been developing. But there's a huge exception here. Right? National security is an exception to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So even to the extent that they reach Americans inside the U.S., they've got a statutory exception that lets them do some of this. Um, making it, again, not impossible, and it's certainly the case that if there were the right set of facts, I would challenge uh, some of these hacking techniques in the U.S., but it, ma it makes my job very hard. So um, that's kind of the sad legal news, and it's why we really need to shift our thinking to how we're going to do this. I mean, again, I'm, I'm open to litigation on this, but I just I want to be honest that, that you know, my, my tools are pretty good for lots of things. They're not very good for this problem. Um, and there are things we need you guys to do. We need you guys to find the security holes. We need you to publish them. We need you to find the places where things have been sabotaged. We need you to do the kind of technical work to figure out what the hell's going on with our technology um, and help us figure out you know, once we get those facts, then I can begin to an analysis to figure out what are the right tools I can use in the domains I'm comfortable with, which is law and policy, to try to adjust them. But we don't know enough about what they're doing right now in terms of the very specifics um, and examples of how this has actually happened to allow us to do a lot with them just yet. Um, the other thing we need to do is we need to pressure the government to come clean about what it's doing and let the American people, I think, I think if in a functioning democracy, it can't be the case that one branch of government has the ability to, spot, to spy on attack and undermine the security of the other two branches of government. So even if you don't care about ordinary people, and I care very much about ordinary people and their ability to protect themselves against bad guys, um, it's a problem for our democracy that the executive branch can spy on the judicial branch and the, and the legislative branch. And, you know, Bernie Sanders, who's a, a senator from Vermont, sent a letter to the, to the NSA and said, so what kind of protections are you giving congressmen, given that we have this thing called a congressional privilege, the, where, where we're privileged uh, in our communications? And the answer that came back from the NSA is you get the same protections as all ordinary Americans. We saw what that is, right? Not very much. Uh, 
So, you know, this is my plea to you guys to get involved in this and help us because we need the technical community, the people who understand crypto and who, under, who can read the code and figure out what's going on to help us identify the problems, um, like the dual EC problem that uh, some researchers at Johns Hopkins and elsewhere uh, just made, publish, uh, made public. Um, we need to be able to figure out what's going on here. We're still kind of fact deprived about this situation. Um, what is EFF doing? Well, just a little, uh, a little over to very little, I, as I said, about this crypto problem right now, other than trying to talk about it as much as we possibly can and support some of the researchers who are doing this research. By the way, the other thing EFF does is if you're engaging in computer security research and you're worried about the legal con, con context in which you do work, uh, we, we advise people all the time. We have a coders' rights project. We've advised people in this room quite a bit about this stuff, and we're happy to help you navigate the legal, the legal side of doing this research um, because we think it's so important that it be done. Most of what EFF is doing in the courts, though, is focusing on the other parts of NSA spying. I just want to talk about that a little bit, and then we'll get to questions. Uh, we have two lawsuits going on in the Northern District of California case, one from 2008 trying to stop mass surveillance. Uh, those are aimed at different programs generally that we talked about having to do with the tapping into the fiber optic cables um, and the other techniques of mass collection that the government's engaging in, including collecting everybody's phone records. Um, the First Unitarian Church versus NSA, which we filed, oh my gosh, that wasn't last month. Last time I gave these slides was in August. That was filed in July. Uh, and in um, that case is aimed at the telephone records collection program. It's talking about the First Amendment and how the right of free speech depends on secrecy of your associations, and I'm happy to talk about that in a little more depth if people want to. Um, we supported LavaBit, which was a tech company that unplugged its services rather than dumb down, you know, basically breach this security. LavaBit had set up its system such that in order to get access to the communications of one person, they had to basically undermine the security of everybody who used the service. They had kind of a one key to rule them all uh, setup, which um, frankly wasn't a, there were other services that uh, they offered secure encryption that really technically if they broke down to ended up to one key to rule them all. But LavaBit unplugged itself rather than undermine the security of all of its customers because the government was looking for information about one of its customers. That case is up in front of the Fourth Circuit. I will tell you, it did not go well for uh, the Lava Bit side. Uh, um, uh, the other ongoing challenge that we face as a community is explaining what we do to people who don't already understand it, including federal judges. Um, and, and that's an ongoing challenge. And, and to, to the extent that people want to help me figure out how to do that, we're developing a project at EFF called Speak Tech to Power where we want to work with technologists to help them understand how it is you talk to policy people and lawmakers and judges about computer security and computer things such that they actually understand it and make the right decisions rather than uh, the wrong decisions. And I'm very, very worried about the Lava Bit case right now going in the wrong direction. Um, but as I said, sabotage is different, difficult to sue over. Um, we are also working internationally. Uh, we've developed something uh, along with a bunch of people around the world called NecessaryAndProportionate.net that's trying to set out <laughs> how international human rights law ought to think about the, the tools of digital surveillance. Um, it includes a little bit about some of this stuff, um, but not all that much because, the, again, we still don't have enough facts to really be able to formulate something specific. But the general principle is whenever the government is engaging in a new surveillance technique, it needs to take steps to figure out whether it's legal that are greater than just deciding for itself that they are legal um, and needs to take steps to check with an outside authority like a judge about whether what they're doing is consistent with our values as a, as a nation. And, and that works all around the world. We have a, over 500 organizations worldwide who's, who signed up. Uh, there's UN reports going that have picked up um, the idea of the principles. There should be one coming out of the UN Human Rights Commission uh, this summer, commissioner 
Nabi Pillay, who is the uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, is doing a report on this stuff, and we're hopeful that she'll come out with something that is consistent with what we think the rule ought to be. We've participated in a European Court of Human Rights complaint. I was an expert witness for the European Court. OAS is the Organization of American States, which is the, the European Court of Human Rights is for Europe. OAS is for the Americas. So we've been participating in international efforts as well because you know, while we are largely a US-based organization, uh, we have members all over the world, and certainly there are people all over the world who deserve to have their privacy protected just as much as people in America. Um, we continue to develop technology, HTTPS Everywhere, the, the SSL Observatory, and other uh, product, projects that we work uh, in conjunction with uh, uh, professors in, all around the world and, and folks all around the world to try to develop more secure technologies. Um, those are the two that had the coolest logos, so those are the ones I pulled. Um, um, but there's still a lot to be done. And my main reason to come here and talk with you guys about this is to try to enlist you. I am, I am, I am an advocate in this position, which is the first thing we have to do is we've got to build more secure tools, and we've got to make them easy for your grandma uh, to use. Um, if we're only writing tools that you can only use if you can understand how to do something on command line, um, you're only preaching to the converted, and those people, like, that's not it, right? We need people who not only understand the deep crypto, but who are willing to do what is the somewhat boring work of making a user interface and making this work for people. Um, we need you to find the evidence of the sabotage so that we can begin to build a story around it that we can present to policymakers. Uh, we need to shore up our current crypto tools against sabotage. Um, and, and try to f figure out how it is that the government is, is, is engaging in all of this, what I think is purely rotten behavior. Um, so those are the things that we need to do. Um, here's a more specific list um, um, of the kinds of things that, that, that you can do if you want to help. Um, and then I want to go back to, my very f to, to where we were before and just kind of remind you why it is we care. Insert vulnerabilities into commercial encryption systems. Actively engage to covertly influence their products design. Shape the marketplace. Make them exploitable while people still think the security is intact. Influence standards, policies, and technologies. Now that I've kind of walked you through some of this, I hope you're as angry as I am. Because I think our government has no business engaging in any of these things. They certainly can develop tools to help them get the bad guys, but they cannot undermine our security, trick us, lie to us in order to do so. That's beyond the bounds of a decent and a leading society. And it ought to be way beyond what our government is doing. So that's my plea. I am not a professor. I am an advocate, so I don't have to give their side. Um, but I'm happy to talk about that if you want to a little bit. Because they've said nothing, it's very difficult to know uh, what actually they would say specifically about each of these um, uh, and why they think it's okay. But I, I, you know, I, I'm happy to talk through some of that and some of the, the arguments that we faced when we did this in the 1990s. Uh, when they were honestly talking about why it is they felt like they needed to dumb down all of our security in order to, to keep us all um, safe. Um, but I wanted to leave some time for questions. So if anybody has any questions, raise your hand. 